Thus, at the heart of Europe, a nation stands as a bastion of revolutionary zeal and entrepreneurial spirit. France. In this nation pulses the very spirit of revolution, echoing the identity of a Europe transformed by the seismic shifts of the bloody French Revolution. From the moment revolutionaries stormed the Bastille, France has seen its share of shifts in economic thought that thread the needle between an entrepreneurial mind and a heart dedicated to social welfare. This raises the question, in what direction will this nation venture to navigate a time more uncertain than ever? As we turn to the 20th and 21st centuries of France's economic history, we unravel a complex tale of identity straddling that begins in the aftermath of World War II. In its recovery from the horrors of Blitzkrieg and occupation, the nation laid the foundation of Le Trente Glorieuse, or the Glorious Thirty, a period of unprecedented growth. While other nations encouraged the progress of their economy through private entrepreneurship, France embraced a dirigiste approach, a form of economic planning and state control. The French government took the reins, in particular by nationalizing key industries such as coal, electricity, gas, and several banks in the post-war period. The strategic state intervention aimed to modernize and rebuild the economy, orchestrating a coordinated dance between the private and public sectors. True to the words of Robespierre, it sought to use this newfound prosperity to enhance the lives of its citizens by establishing comprehensive social security, including universal healthcare, education, pensions, and robust public services, France ensured that its citizens shared in the fruits of its post-war labor. However, such golden times were not to last. As France ventured into the latter half of the 20th century and beyond, it faced the familiar cyclical challenges of economic shifts and social upheaval. The persistent question was, and continues to be, how a nation with such a fierce dedication to its citizens' welfare can navigate an ever-changing global landscape. Can an inward focus on public service sustain a country through increasingly frequent shocks to the economic system? France would soon find its chance to answer those questions. Much of the prosperity during Le Trente Glorieux was fueled by readily available, cheap energy from oil. This access to oil allowed France to power its rapid industrialization, spurring the growth of key industries such as the automotive, aerospace, and chemical sectors, and allowing suburbia to expand, further simulating automotive culture. Lacking domestic oil resources, France was heavily reliant on Middle Eastern oil to sustain this growth. With few nations having direct access to this precious resource, oil prices remained relatively stable, largely due to the price-setting influence of the Seven Sisters oil companies. This stability allowed France to craft long-term economic plans without fear of significant disruption from market volatility. However, in 1973, the equilibrium was shattered. On October 6, 1973, Egyptian and Syrian forces crossed the Suez Canal, challenging Israeli defenses and setting the region ablaze with conflict. This Yom Kippur war prompted the United States to supply Israel with arms, a move that realigned geopolitical stances worldwide. France, seeking to maintain a more neutral stance, advocated for peace and negotiation, ostensibly to preserve its diplomatic ties with the Arab nations, a critical linchpin of its economic success. Nevertheless, France's efforts to remain neutral could not shield it from the forthcoming economic shockwave. In a show of force, OAPEC, Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, enacted an oil embargo that sent Western economies spiraling. Oil prices soared to unprecedented levels, and while the impact was global, France felt the crunch acutely. As nations scrambled to secure oil amid shortages, France confronted both exorbitant costs and scarcity, poisoning the fertile landscape that had birthed its new economy. The fallout was immediate and severe. Production costs soared, inflation spiraled out of control, and the robust purchasing power and savings that France had worked so hard to secure were significantly eroded. The burgeoning economic growth slowed to a crawl. In the wake of these trying times, political tides began to shift. The economic strain incited a surge to the left, as communist and socialist parties harnessed the public's discontent, presenting an alternative vision for government's role in welfare and the economy. Debates over income distribution resurfaced, and as the cost of living escalated, workers demanded wage increases, leading to a wave of strikes across France. The government's response was multifaceted. To reduce energy consumption, measures were put in place, such as lowering heating in public buildings, diminishing public lighting, and promoting initiatives like carpooling and car-free days. Eager to establish energy independence, France expedited the development of nuclear power, a decision that would later position it as a global leader in this sector. 
Philosophically and economically, France took a path less trodden by Western peers by implementing wage and price controls to manage the spiraling cost of living, measures not as commonly adopted elsewhere. A significant investment was poured into public transport and energy sectors, aiming to pivot away from the vulnerability exposed by oil dependency. For those hit hardest by the crisis, the government expanded welfare programs and created employment initiatives. Industrially, there was a strategic move away from energy-intensive sectors like coal and steel, and towards burgeoning high-tech and service industries, including telecommunications and finance, setting the stage for a modernized, resilient economy. Through the oil embargo concluded in 1974, France's economic revival was sluggish, not gaining tangible momentum until the late 1970s. Yet, as the country began to show signs of recovery, another blow struck. The 1979 Iranian Revolution upended the oil market anew. Iranian oil production faltered, causing global oil prices to double and precipitating recessions across the globe. The French populace, wary from the recent hardships, clamored for change. Responding to these pressures, the French government increased public spending in an effort to prop up slowing growth, combat unemployment, and stem inflation, marking a significant political shift in the Fifth Republic. The election of Socialist President François Mitterrand in 1981 brought with it a new economic agenda. Under the banner Change is Now, Mitterrand initiated an expensive state intervention program, despite a global trend toward economic liberalization. However, these measures yielded mixed outcomes. Although immediate suffering was mitigated, issues like high inflation, a growing trade deficit, and rising unemployment persisted. By 1983, in the face of such challenges, the French government made a dramatic pivot with Le Tournant de la Rigueur, the austerity turn, focusing on deficit reduction and economic stabilization. This turnaround included a cessation of company nationalizations and a push towards privatization as a means to invigorate the economy. The 1990s saw a continuation of this market-friendly trajectory, even under the leadership of a centrist president. The privatization of many state-owned enterprises was part of a strategy to infuse dynamism into the economy. The controversial decision to adopt the euro and join the European Monetary Union was driven by a desire to integrate more deeply with Europe's emerging economic framework, though it was met with significant debate regarding sovereignty and economic autonomy. Throughout these shifts, France grappled with the tension between economic liberalization and social welfare. The implementation of a 35-hour work week intended to redistribute work and address unemployment exemplified the country's commitment to social policy, but also ignited discussions about competitiveness and the cost of labor. While privatization and labor reform were on the agenda, public investment remained robust. This paradoxical identity, a nation striving to maintain its global economic standing while honoring its social contract to citizens, proved a delicate balancing act. Yet, France managed to reconcile these dual priorities, achieving a status as Europe's second largest economy, trailing only behind Germany. The Eurozone crisis, a direct reverberation from the US housing crash, plunged France into the depths of financial turmoil. Prior to the crisis, President Nicolas Sarkozy had already taken decisive steps by raising the pension age from 60 to 62, a move that unleashed a wave of mass protests and strikes. Alongside budgetary austerity and tax hikes, Sarkozy also instigated labor market reforms aimed at easing the rigidity around employment. These actions stirred the French once more towards the socialist movement. However, despite his successor, President Francois Hollande's initial endeavors to follow traditional socialist policies, the stark realities of the crisis necessitated a swift pivot towards his predecessor's economic philosophies. Holland, during his presidency, continued on a reformative trajectory, increasing taxes on the wealthy while offering tax breaks to businesses. Notable legislation such as the Loi Macron and the Loi El Khomri further liberalized labor laws, albeit at the cost of igniting more civil unrest. In an attempt to tighten the nation's financial belt, cuts to various spending programs were introduced, which incrementally yet significantly brewed public dissatisfaction. The augmentation of diesel taxes was the last straw for many French citizens who had grown weary of erratic reforms, with disillusionment pervading sentiments towards the conventional left and right political spectrums, the stage was set for an unconventional candidate to emerge. Enter Emmanuel Macron, an investment banker turned political trailblazer. As Minister of the Economy under Holland, Macron was the architect behind several economic reforms in 2016. In a bold and unforeseen maneuver, 
he resigned and founded his own political party, La République en Marche. Despite skepticism, the combination of public disenchantment with traditional parties, his pro-European union stance, and centric policies resonated with a voter base eager for modernization among the rising tides of Euroscepticism post-Brexit. With France's fiscal future hanging in the balance, Macron's expertise in economics and his vision for labor reform and modernization captivated the business-oriented and those yearning for innovative economic strategies. A scandal within the Republican camp further fragmented the conservative vote, while Macron's youthful vigor galvanized the younger demographic. In a dramatic twist, he clinched the presidency. Macron's presidency promised to be categorized by a delicate dance of fiscal austerity, economic liberalism, and social investment. However, it was not immune to public backlash. His reforms targeted job creation and sought to reduce France's high unemployment rate by dismantling industry-wide agreements, capping severance pay, facilitating employee dismissals, and minimizing bureaucracy for small businesses. While these measures won the favor of the entrepreneurial community, they were starkly opposed by labor unions and the political left, perceived as an assault on workers' rights. The proposed overhaul of the pension system introduced a point-based system and increasing the eligibility age ignited one of the most proactive transport strikes in the country's history. Macron's effort to navigate through France's towering debt and revitalize the economy marked just the beginning of his ambitious yet contentious presidency. He would find his biggest challenge in 2020 a year that shocked the globe. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, President Macron's resolve was put to the test as the virus wrought havoc on the French economy. With a resolute commitment to safeguarding employment, his government took decisive action, subsidizing wages for workers barred from their jobs, guaranteeing loans and grants to floundering businesses, offering deferrals on tax payments, and even flirting with the renationalization of certain industries. Macron's declaration that they would do whatever it takes harked back to his 2012 stance, signaling an unwavering dedication to the people. The emergency measures proved effective, staving off an economic collapse and providing a lifeline to millions. France's swift and significant spending underpinned the resilience of its economy during the international pandemic onslaught. As the immediate crisis waned, President Macron unveiled a transformative recovery strategy. The ambitious 100 billion euro France relance plan was a cornerstone of this strategy, designed to spur economic growth and innovation through through substantial investments in green technologies, digitalization, and bolstering the backbone of the French economy, its small businesses. Integral to this was the collective muscle of the European Union, which provided critical financial support to its member states, softening the recession's expected severity. The French economy responded with vigor, displaying a resilience that outstripped forecasts. Growth sectors, especially in technology and renewable energy, benefited from Macron's vision of positioning France at the forefront of modern industries. Nonetheless, Macron's tenure wasn't without domestic contention. Attempts to reform pensions and unemployment insurance were met with resistance, sparking protests that echoes France's revolutionary zeal for social justice. Despite these hurdles, the prevailing economic climate bore a tint of optimism. Macron's strategy was more than just a recuperative measure. It was an investment in France's future, a gamble on state-driven investment as a catalyst for enduring progress. Emmanuel Macron's navigation through the pandemic's challenges reflects a modern interpretation of France's revolutionary ethos, a fusion of liberal economic initiatives and staunch social commitment. This delicate endeavor of aligning liberty with economic laissez-faire remains fraught with tension, as public sentiment vacillates between supportive and dissenting. As the narrative of France continues to unfold, the revolutionary spirit of its past is not just a backdrop, but an active player in its present. President Emmanuel Macron stands at the confluence of tradition and modernity, trying to chart a course that is as respectful of France's rich history as it is ambitious for its future. The world watches with a mix of skepticism and curiosity. Can Macron's policies reinvigorate the French economy and cement its place on the world stage? And how would they assuage the fiery spirit of a people deeply protective of their social contract? As the nation strides forward, it is not without a sense of déjà vu. The fervor that once fueled a revolution now fuels the debate for progress. Time will tell whether France's latest chapter harmonizes the melody of its revolutionary anthem with the complex symphony of global progress. But one thing remains certain, the revolutionary heart of France still beats strong, pulsing with the vibrancy of a nation ever in motion, ever defiant, ever evolving. Thanks for watching.